Welcome to the Friday edition of Juan's World and my, I suppose, middle-sized news this week is that on Sunday I had an email from the president of the missionary college where I taught last year asking me if I wanted to teach this semester, which I really don't. <laughs> but COVID-19 has made me a little bit isolated and he ended up only asking me to teach one class which is like one afternoon a week and my publishers are going to be taken care of mostly by next week. I've, I've got to send back an edited manuscript at the end of this week and my other two manuscripts are away being dealt with. Um, one of them's being, I guess, kind of ignored by one publisher and the other one is out for review with some um, graduate students. So I've got a little bit of time and the semester will last until the end of May with a lot of breaks like the Cambodian New Year so I said, okay, so I went to have lunch with him yesterday and we ironed out the details and on February 19th I will begin a graduate seminar on the history and doctrine of the early church from the first centuries, that is from the crucifixion up to the finalizing of orthodoxy in doctrine and I'm teaching it because there's no one else around to do it <laughs> and because my my price is right <clears throat> I'm, I'm doing it for the cost of lunch <laughs> so what I want to talk about today in this video is what doctrine is and why it matters and Maybe many people will say, well, it doesn't really matter I mean, if you're not Christian. Well, here's the thing that everyone has beliefs about something. And where do beliefs come from? And why do we have them? Can we change them? Well, that's the question that the early Christian church was asking specifically about doctrine and at the same time it was deciding which books should be considered sacred and put together into a bible that would be a permanent store of all the sacred books and the decision as to what to include and what to exclude was based on a fairly flimsy idea that is that books could be excluded if they were not considered to be given by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that they had to be an authentic testament of the Holy Spirit. Now that's a pretty hard test and it took a long time, took several centuries to figure it out. So I'd like to just go through some minor details maybe of what I'm going to be teaching for the coming few months. Now I'm willing to wager a fair amount that the great bulk of uh, pew sitters in congregations around the world don't know or care much, if anything, about doctrine. 
I mean, there are certain pretty fundamental doctrines that they may assent to in some kind of way. For example, the Trinity. The Trinity is a foundational doctrine of the Christian Church. And the big problem with doctrine is that it's not based on anything really tangible in the Bible. That's why it's doctrine. It's the difference between the subjects that I'm teaching, which is church history and church doctrine. Church history we can document in normal historical ways. We can look at um, primary sources, uh, we can even look at archaeology and all kinds of things. That's history. Doctrine grows out of history, grows out of the Bible, and it forms the basis of belief of the church. And at one time, right at the beginning, which is the period that I'm covering in my seminar, doctrine was uniform. It had to be because the church wanted to be what they called at the time, although they used Latin, they wanted it to be Catholic. And Catholic means universal. They wanted everybody to agree about things like the Trinity, the nature of Jesus, the importance of the sacraments, uh, baptism and uh, the Lord's Supper and so forth. They didn't want disagreement. And they held a whole series of councils uh, through the fifth century, nailing things down and creating, among other things, creeds. A creed comes from the first word in Latin of the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed and so forth. It begins credo. Credo in Latin means I believe. And if you happen to know any of these creeds, such as the Apostles' Creed, you'll know that it begins. I believe in God the Father Almighty and goes on to state all the things that you believe. And reciting that creed is your testament to being orthodox. And so the big question that I'm uh, going to be discussing is how those creeds were set in place. But I'm also going to be talking about the evolution of the church itself. Now, when you read the Greek Bible, you don't get much information about what a church should be like, how it should be ruled, um, how people should live, it, and so forth. I mean, there, there are moral injunctions, but not the practical ones. And so I'm going to look at how the church evolved and it's really quite fascinating to me because the the earliest church the church that developed in Jerusalem was to me quite special and it's not really been replicated since that time according to the acts of the apostles the very first christians you know, from the fourth decade of the first century onwards but only for about uh, 20 or so years those first Christians all lived in communities not not in communes but but in adjacent houses and they pooled all of their resources they didn't own their own property or their own um, uh, capital or, you know, they, they, when, you, when you became a member of what was called the way, they weren't called Christians, you gave up all of your possessions to the church. And you lived in a house 
that was in, in the community um, together. And if you worked outside the community, then you brought your wages back and gave them to the community. The community fed you and the people ate communally. They worshipped communally. Everything was done in a communal manner. And that church in Jerusalem died in the year 70 when the uh, Roman legions came in and crushed a, a Jewish rebellion and destroyed the temple and dispersed everybody, in, uh, including the Christians. The churches that survived were the churches that Paul had created in his missionary journeys. He'd wandered all over Asia Minor, uh, into Europe, even down into Rome. Uh, Rome maintains its primacy um, as one of the earliest churches formed because it was formed by Paul himself. Whether or not Peter was the first um, pope, if you like, is an open question, but, but there's no question that Paul founded the church in Rome, as he did also in Ephesus, in Corinth, in Galatea, all over the known world, the Mediterranean world. And those churches were not beholden to Jerusalem or Rome or anywhere else, and that's where the, the epistles come from. Because Paul would land in a place like Corinth and he'd say, okay, here's, here's the good news, the God spiel, the good, the good spiel, the, the gospel. Uh, and a lot of people would say, oh, this is great, and we'll form a church. And, and then he, Paul would go off somewhere else and he'd get news back from, let's say, Corinth saying, well, we don't quite remember everything you said and, and we've got a few problems and uh, we're, we're not sure whether we should be your disciples or um, maybe we should be Timothy's disciples or should we be Jesus' disciples? And so he had to write back to them and say, look, you, look let's get it straight. So Paul put in place a lot of details that are missing from the Gospels. And you have to remember also that the Gospels were written after Paul's epistles. Paul's epistles are the first sacred texts in the Greek Testament. The first Gospel was Mark's Gospel, probably written somewhere around the year 60, written before the destruction of the Temple. Luke and Matthew were written after Mark and after the destruction of the, the temple, probably in around 80. And John's gospel wasn't written and probably until near the very end of the century. And they were all written, well, Matthew and Luke were written based on Mark. They had Mark in front of them and, and they added pieces uh, Luke and Matthew, for example, added parts of the infancy narratives, the Christmas story, and added a lot of stuff at the end about the resurrection and the reappearance of Jesus and so forth. Mark just begins with uh, Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist. And it ends on the third day after the crucifixion. The crucifixion itself is the centerpiece of all of the Gospels and, and that material probably is very, very early. The, the, the crucifixion narrative was, was probably spread orally very shortly after Jesus' death. Well, in Mark, it's, it's, it's a remarkable end. It says Jesus was died, died on the cross, and buried, and buried before sunset on the Sabbath, that is Friday evening, that nobody could touch the tomb 
on the Saturday, the full Sabbath, um, because it was the Sabbath, and then it was dark and they couldn't do anything. So the next morning at sunrise, what well, is Sunday, they arrived at the tomb and found that the stone was rolled away and it was empty. The end. <laughs> that's, that's, that's how Mark ends. So what you make of that is kind of up to you because by the time we get to Luke and Matthew and then on to John, we're talking about at least a generation after the events that happened. And that's where doctrine comes in. Doctrine becomes the way of filling in the blanks, of saying this is what it actually means. This is why these things happened and this is what you should accept. That's in the early days. That, that's all I'm ultimately going to be teaching about. After that, going into the 11th century, the church split between East and West, and then going down into the 16th century, then we had the Protestant Reformation, and blah, 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 blah. And all of those denominations are separated according to differences in doctrine. But they all agree on certain foundational doctrines that were laid down in the first few centuries of the common era. Now the two great doctrines that I will be spending a great deal of time on in my, my class are the Trinity and what's called Christology. Um, Tr Trinity you may know about more than Christology but they're, they both have the same problems. The Trinity got hashed out for well over 300 years because it's not in the Bible. The Bible speaks about Jesus and talks about him as God in some places and the Holy Spirit is talked about and God the Creator is talked about so that, for example, in Genesis 1, the very beginning, it says, we think, it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth because in the beginning it was dark and there were waters all around and God's ruach, moved over the waters. But Ruach has two meanings in Hebrew. It can mean spirit or it can mean wind. And exactly the same ambiguity exists in Greek. That spirit and wind are, are in some sense equivalent just as when you see a, the leaves of a tree moving you know that the wind is moving the leaves, but you can't see the wind. You can feel it, but you can't see it. The same with the Spirit of God. You can feel the Spirit, but you can't see it. And the divinity of Jesus is most profoundly articulated in John's Gospel. If, if, if John's Gospel did not exist, then the Trinity might not exist either because John opens kind of um, echoing Genesis by saying in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God. So that you've got these three components at the beginning. You've got God who is the creator and his creative ability is through his word and his spirit is moving at the very beginning. So you've got these three entities, the creator, the word, 
and the spirit. <coughs> now, in the early church, they couldn't decide, are we talking about three things? One thing? Is there one God who expresses, expresses himself in three different ways? Or are there three separate things? And if there are, are they three different gods? And the, and the church argued about it over and over and over. And a lot of different churches who split away from um, the central church because it had disagreements. Uh, some uh, wanted to deny the divinity of Jesus. Uh, some thought of the three entities that are called God as being three different gods, and so on. And so the church ultimately, in, at the Council of Nicaea, came to this final decision. God is three and God is one. They're not three persons, they are, well, they're not three gods, they are three persons who are one. And that's it. It's a mystery. <laughs> We're not going to explain it anymore. But they're not just aspects of one God. They are three persons, but they are one God. <sighs> well, I mean, in many, many, many later years, going down into the 19th century, there are a lot of people who have trouble with that doctrine, as I do. I, it doesn't make any sense. The other um, doctrinal problem that I'm going to be talking about is what's called the Christological problem. How can Jesus, at the same time, be fully human and fully God. And that was also decided in those first centuries of the Christian era. Now when I was at uh, university I had to study doctrine uh, quite extensively. In my first year I had to sit an exam on doctrine and in my finals I had to do two papers on the development of doctrine which is how I know the subject. I had to study it very well. And at that time, I wasn't in the least interested. It didn't, it didn't concern me at all about how Origen or Arius or Athanasius or whoever had construed the Trinity and the Christological problem. And, and to a large extent, it still doesn't bother me. When I was uh, being ordained, I also had to sit an exam on doctrine. And I gave the examiners what they wanted. <laughs> and um, the ministers of my presbytery also had the capacity to examine me on doctrine, but they really didn't. Uh, there were some evangelical pastors in the presbytery who tried, but they were pretty much... Uh, squeezed out. Because the fact of the matter is that most pastors who have studied these things don't accept orthodox doctrine at all. Even though every Sunday they recite either the Apostles' Creed, which is the most common one, or sometimes the Nicene Creed. The Apostles' Creed is um, you know, pretty universal. And it starts off with things like, um, um, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in his Son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the Virgin Mary. Well, they don't believe that. They don't believe in, in most of the miraculous stuff. And I don't either. So, I mean, at minimum, they and I can be accused of hypocrisy, that's fair enough. But I'm not interested in orthodox doctrine that was formulated almost 2,000 years ago because it's based on 
uh, philosophy and theology that is grossly outdated. And I certainly, when I was a pastor, didn't preach about doctrine from the pulpit. That is, uh, the president of the college where I'm going to be teaching said, well, you do because all preaching is doctrine. And I, can, I understand that we've got the Bible itself and then we've got the interpretation of the Bible. And doctrine is, by definition, interpretation of the Bible. So in a very loose sense, my sermons were doctrine, but only in a very loose sense. They weren't orthodox doctrine. What people want to hear from a sermon is something spiritually uplifting. And so I would take a segment of the Bible each week and interpret it spiritually to help people. The only time I really was supposed to teach doctrine was when people wished to join the church, particularly young people, and it was expected that we had lessons in catechism which would go over the doctrines, and I did that to a degree. But even the people joining the church weren't joining it because of doctrine. People don't join a church because they look around and they say, ah, the doctrines of this particular church really appeal to me. They join a church because uh, their friends are there, or like in many cases, like in my case, I'm a Presbyterian because my father was a Presbyterian. My wife was a Methodist because her parents were Methodists. That's kind of how it works. Um, and you get indoctrinated <laughs> into the church that you grow up in and it just feels like home and so I don't I don't have any problem with avoiding doctrine with people because that's not why they come to me if they come to me with personal problems they don't want to hear doctrine you know like um, I had um, a person in one of my churches who was really distraught about her divorce um, and her ex-husband also went to the church and they were at loggerheads all the time and she would come to me now and again she didn't want to hear about church doctrine on divorce and the church had, does have doctrines on divorce and different denominations have different doctrines. That's not what she wanted to hear. And numerous people came to me with various issues. Like people came to me, they wanted to be married. I didn't spend any time talking to them about marriage as a, as a doctrinal issue. <laughs> I was interested in making sure that they were getting married for what we could call the right reasons. That is, that they were not just um, doing it um, without thinking. So I'd make them think about it. And when I left the United States, I'm, I'm really glad that I did not know of any single couple that I had married who had since separated or divorced. Um, I don't know anymore because I don't keep touch. But I had the power and never had to actually exercise it, but I had the power to refuse to marry people if I didn't think that it was appropriate. But I wasn't thinking in doctrinal terms, I was thinking in social terms. Because underneath it all, I'm an anthropologist and I'm interested in social issues. And that's how I read the Bible. I read the Bible anthropologically. I don't read it doctrinally. Well, anyway, we're fast approaching Lent. And today, um, Friday, when this shows, is the first day of the Chinese New Year, the Year of the Ox. So we're all gearing up for that here in Cambodia right now.
Next Tuesday, I'm going to be doing something with collops of meat because Monday, when I actually make the video, is collop Monday. Tuesday is pancake day or pancake Tuesday. I've already done a recipe video on pancakes. So we'll do collops on, well, I'll make it on Monday and you'll see it on Tuesday. And meanwhile, please tell your friends about my videos. Please like and subscribe and have a glorious and joyous happy year of the ox.